Welcome to Full Stack Conference. I am super excited to be here. I was um, really, really jealous of all of my friends who attended Baruco last year, so I am pretty excited to be here this year. This is a beautiful venue. Um, so happy to see everyone here. It's a packed house. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I am Davey Stevenson, uh, Davey on GitHub, um, Davey Stevenson on Twitter. And I studied astrophysics in college along with computer science. So you'll see lots and lots of space photos because, come on, it's really pretty. Uh, recently, I joined GitHub as an engineering manager. So I am pretty excited about that. It's only been a couple weeks, but it's been pretty exciting so far. So back to orders of magnitude. So what I'm going to be talking about is numbers big numbers and small numbers and all of the other numbers in between. And more importantly, how our brain deals with these numbers. Number sense is the idea that certain animals have an innate sense and understanding of numbers built into their brains. Uh, it might not be surprising to know that animals such as elephants and dolphins have been shown to have number sense. But it's not only restricted to mammals. Uh, number sense has been proven for birds such as crows. And perhaps even more surprisingly, it's been shown that certain insects have an idea about numbers as well, such as bees and ants. So within, when you're thinking about number sense, it's, it's really about kind of some of the smaller numbers, right? These animals can distinguish one of something between, from two of something, or even three of something but from four of something. Uh, but this sort of breaks down at usually around the numbers five or six, uh, though these animals can still often distinguish bigger gaps, such as eight from 12, knowing that the 12 pile is bigger than the eight pile. So humans also exhibit number sense, but what you might find a little bit surprising is that our number sense isn't measurably much better than a lot of these animals, including you know, ants or bees. So it's kind of like, Shouldn't we know numbers better than ants? Evidently not. Um, so human groups that have not developed finger counting yet have a hard time discerning quantities above about the number four. So this brings us to our first lie about numbers, that our brains inherently understand numbers. So we may be born with number sense, but we must learn to count. And for us, it might be hard to imagine life before counting, uh, but learning to count was only really advantageous to our ancestors once we became farming and managing livestock. Uh, counting allows us to distinguish num numbers larger than four, and many of the common ways of finger counting, or counting beyond the simple finger counting include uh, creating stacks of pebbles, uh, notching lines onto sticks, or even making knots on ropes. And what this allows us to do is that for humans that don't have yet words for various numbers, we can still keep track of things like our herd of sheep by keeping track of a stack of pebbles that go alongside our herd. And once we had things that we needed to count, it makes sense to begin naming these various numbers. It's a lot easier to say, I have eight sheep, rather than saying, I have this many sheep, and then dumping out your little pile of pebbles that you carry around with you, right? Uh, but even, even naming numbers was a little bit hard. Uh, a lot of the uh, initial first ways that we came up with counting was very limited. We'd come up with, with words for one and two, but then everything else might be many. And this type of counting exists today still in the, the San tribe of Namibia. Various Aboriginal tribes in Australia still continue to have uh, only these numbers, uh, names in their, uh, for numbers in their languages, and the Paraha tribe in, in the Amazon. Beyond that, many languages started creating different names for number words. And a really, really good example of this is the Thymshian language, which is spoken by a tribe up in British Columbia, so near the Pacific Northwest, where me and many other people, speakers here are from. So the Thymshian language had different sets of 
names for numbers depending on what was actually being counted. So when you were talking about having two of something that was a flat object versus two trees, that would be a different number. And you can see here that they had a very extensive list of different types of things to count. I, my favorite is that there's numbers for long objects and trees and then a completely different set of numbers for canoes because that's really important. And before we spend too much time thinking about how silly this seems, uh, let's look at the, the English language. And we can see that the English language bears this history inside of it still. These are all different number, names that we have for the number two, depending on what type of thing that we're counting. So that brings us to another lie, which is that counting things is easy. It was actually a very difficult thing to come up with abstract counting and to come up with the idea that the number uh, as an abstract concept is different than the thing that you're actually counting. And counting takes mental energy. So now that we have a bunch of words to describe the numbers that we're using, we can be begin creating numeral systems around these words. The, one of the more common ones that we might know about is the Roman numeral system. Uh, this numeral system is an improved tallying methodology. So we have, you know, the, like just the notches for one, but we improved that and created V for five and uh, X for 10 and so on. This number system is positioned by value. So you can see on this example, the one tallies are all to the left and the, they get larger as you go, or to the right, and the larger as you go to the left, because backwards. Um, and they have one slight addition to that, which was subtractive notation. So you can see here in the MCM, that M, um, or that C rather, before that second M, C is 100, M is 1,000. That C says actually subtract 100 from that M. So there's obviously some, some drawbacks to the Roman, Roman numeral system. It can be hard at a glance to see uh, or tell what this number is, right? I mean, it's been up there for a while. Anyone know? Anyone figured it out? 1928, I think that's right. Who knows? I haven't written it down. Um, so beyond that, uh, we came up with the uh, Arabic numeral system. And this has a lot of improvements over the Roman. Uh, in this case, each value in the number base, in our case, 10, each value gets a representational character. And beyond that, we came up with the idea of positional notation, which is that the sequence of digits creates a number, and their position in, uh, in the number has meaning. From there, it, we were easily able to come up with the concept of exponentiation. Now that the digits have a place, that place can be counted. So here we have an example given this number 100,045. We can also describe that as 1 times 10 to the fifth plus 4 times 10 to the 1 plus 5 times 10 to the 0. Uh, this can also be represented using the E notation, uh, where it's E5, E1, E0. And I'm going to continue using this notation because it's shorter and didn't require me to highlight all the numbers and hit sub superscript, because that takes a really long time in Keynote. <clears throat> so now once we have these positions, we can then clearly name those because we're really good at naming things by now. So here we have some examples of the different names that we've come up with for the various exponents. Uh, thousand, million, billion, trillion, kilo, mega, giga, tera, so on and so forth. And so what these number systems and what these names do is allow us to count much, much bigger and much, much smaller numbers uh, really easily and be able to transfer that information to each other by just speaking a word, 100,000, 10 million, right? 3.5 gigahertz. Uh, but the lie that's embedded within that is that this naming of these numbers don't yet allow us to truly understand them. So in reality, our number sense is limited to numbers such as one, two, three, and four. Counting is actually pretty hard and kind of causes our brains to do a little bit of work and naming a, uh, a number does not mean that we understand it. And so what can we use these takeaways to help, help us in our day-to-day? -day? 
So one good example is, you know, in, in, when we're displaying our content to our users, right? Here we have like a very common uh, top nav bar, sidebar, main content area. And what you notice is that's three different sections, not five, not 10, but three, because that's something that our eyes can immediately see and distinguish. And we can tell where things are without having to start counting um, or adding, uh, getting into that area of our brain. Similarly, instead of, if, if you have a bunch of numbers, instead of creating a table and just displaying out just tons and tons of digits, it's much more valuable uh, to the people you're trying to express some numbers to, to create these charts, or graphs, or bar charts, or pie charts, or any type of, any type of thing that's not just a table of numbers. And this allows our um, eyes to kind of understand what those numbers are trying to say to us. And it also can help us write better code itself. Uh, we uh, have a lot of these concepts of uh, single responsibility principle or you know, only putting a couple different lines in our methods. And well, one of those reasons is that by only having three things in that method to keep track of, uh, that's something that our brains can hold on to really easily and understand what that method does much more easily. Same thing for tests. And then I also like to take it up another level, which is that um, you can take this too far, right? When you're breaking things down, you sp spread things out across lots of different classes. But that can also lead to problems on the other end, where you need to open too many files and keep them open and, and keep cross-referencing. It can also be important to, when you're dealing with something, uh, some sort of concept, some sort of flow of code, to be able to view it by only opening a couple different classes. So in order to talk about what very big and very small numbers are, first we're going to need to define a baseline for our human experience. And I'm going to do that for both distance and time. For distance, I'm going to be using one meter. One meter is about the size of our bodies. It's about the size of what we can grasp uh, from, from our existence. So that's going to be the baseline. So if that's our baseline, what's the smallest thing that we can see? And that's something along the, so the scale of a human hair, which is one ten thousandth of a meter. And what's the biggest thing, the largest thing that we can touch or see and conceptualize? And I claim that's going to be a mountain, which is about 10,000 meters. And I pick this above, you know, we can see bigger things, but we can see the moon in the sky, right? But we can't climb it. We can't... Um, we can't touch it, feel it physically. It's still very abstract. But a mountain, we can see in the distance, and we can climb it. So for time, I'm going to claim that one hour is kind of our baseline of uh, existence. We kind of divide up the day in one-hour chunks. That's kind of a good, a good base point, right? So what's the smallest thing that we experience? And that's going to be the blink of an eye, which is, again, about a ten-thousandth of, of an hour. And the biggest thing that we can experience is our entire lifespan. And that is about 100,000 hours. So this brings us to another lie, which is that we have direct experience with very big and very small numbers. In fact, we don't. We, as a day-to-day, -day, as humans, only experience things in the scale of thousands. The width of a hair to a mountain, the blink of an eye to a life lifespan. These are thousands to thousands scale. Humans long ago discovered that curved, clear surfaces were magnifiers. Um, but for a long time, we didn't really understand the mathematics uh, needed to control the reflection of light. This didn't stop us from creating lenses to help modify the world around us. The Nimrod lens is one of the oldest discovered lenses. Um, dates back to about 750 BC and uh, was located in um, Assyria? Anyway, these sorts of lenses were created, uh, were found in Assyria, Egypt, Greece, and Babylon from about that time period. These lenses were barely more than crude magnifiers, but they helped spark our imagination for being able to see and experience something beyond what our, simply our eyes could experience. <clears throat> Optic theory is the study of how curved mirrors and uh, lenses bend and control light. And the, in order to really gain control over the ability to, to, to magnify uh, light, we needed to discover the law of refraction. 
And this allows us to uh, focus light to a single point. Once we had that, we could uh, create new things such as microscopes, which were invented in 1590, and telescopes in 1608. So now we have a drastically expanding world. Uh, due to these inventions and many others, we have uh, been able to drastically increase our knowledge about the world uh, around us. And this has only happened in the last couple hundred years. So now let's go back to our baseline, right? So we started out with a number, uh, one meter. Now we can see things that are much, much smaller than that. We can discover bacteria at e to the negative six, or a millionth of a meter. M microprocessor memory cells right now, uh, the 14 nanometer resolution was shipped in 2014. That's about e to the negative eight. The current smallest gate length is five nanometers. Uh, that's the gate length of a 16 nanometer processor, which is pretty amazing. This is e to the negative nine. And this is even more impressive when you think that atoms themselves are only e to the negative 10. So the diameter of a silver atom is 153 picometers. And we've also been able to see things as tiny as a single electron, e to the negative 15. We've also been able to see and in investigate much, much bigger things. We've been able to send a man to the moon, e to the six meters. We have the sun, which is e to the nine. And the sun isn't even that big of a star. So that you, can see, you can see the tiny little sun speck up there. Uh, Rigel's e to the 11, and Betelgeuse is e to the 12. And because I like stars, we're going to stop. Both of those are in the constellation Orion, which I always kind of like because they're near each other. So we've got Betelgeuse up here, Orion's shoulder. Rigel down here is one of its feet. And we also have Sirius, um, which is the brightest star in the sky. Well, that's not all. So we've been able to use the Hubble telescope and other telescopes to see very deep into our uh, universe and view things such as the pillars of creation. This is just a small subset of the interstellar gas and dust in the Eagle Nebula. Uh, these pillars are so created because they're the birthplace of brand new stars. And the leftmost pillar there is about four light years in length, or e to the 16. We're going to time. Now we can uh, do things much, much smaller in time. The measure the synapse of our, our brain is e to the negative seven, one microsecond. Back in 1980, the processor cycles of five megahertz, that was e to the negative 10 already back then. And right now, the 3.5 gigahertz uh, is about e to the negative 13. And we've also been able to study things much, much bigger in time scale than our a single lifetime. We've been able to determine what, what one of the longest lived creatures on this planet is, which is the bristlecone pine, which lives for 5,000 years. That itself is dwarfed by the, light, the time that humans have been on the Earth themselves, 200,000 years, or e to the nine. And dinosaurs lived on the Earth for 100 million years, or e to the 12th. So now we have this lie, which is that we've been able to explore the world in great detail for a long time. In fact, this is a lot of very recent knowledge that we've discovered only in the last couple hundred years. So the next topic is estimating the odds. Our, one of the most important tasks given to our brains is being able to determine risk, determine chances of things, right? We uh, need to know what's dangerous to us and because we have a desire to keep ourselves alive. So we need to determine when and if our life is in immediate danger. Unfortunately, our brain isn't really so good at that. We tend to prioritize things that are um, much more immediate risks, such as the fear of snakes or the fear of sharks, uh, as opposed to things that are much more uh, long-term risks but are more likely to harm us in the end, such as driving in cars or smoking cigarettes. So that brings us to another lie, which is that our brains are good at calculating odds. I'm sure none of us have ever thought any of these things. And by that I mean all of us have thought all of these things. And this is the response that we should be telling our brains when it tries to tell us these things. <clears throat> As the number of possible instances grows, 
the number of users using our software, the number of times certain methods are going to be called, the chances of the edge cases occurring are going to be rising dramatically. So to rem remember ourselves when we're thinking about these things in the context of writing software is that extremely large numbers are new experiences for our brains. We like to throw around these numbers, you know, 3.5 gigahertz, right? That's something we can throw around. We act as if we know what that means. But that is such a small slice of time that our brains literally cannot comprehend what that means. And calculating the odds of something occurring when dealing with these numbers that our brains have no concept of imagining is incredibly difficult. So how many people might have experienced something like this before? And so this is, the, from Wikipedia, one of the people with the longest legal names. So this guy is clearly a German. It goes by Hubert Wolfstern. Um, but yeah, this is his legal name. He had 26 uh, given names, one for each letter of the alphabet. And then, but that's still, let's see if I'm going to use my, oh yeah, look at that. So that's, that only got us to Zeus. So like this right here, just that's his last name. Look at that. So <laughs> can your user interface handle this guy? <laughs> and then we also have people like uh, Cher that ha legally only have one legal name. They do not have a first name and a last name. And you know, Cher and other people who change their names legally are not the only ones. The royal families of Japan and Indonesia also traditionally only had single names. And if you know, the emperor of Japan wants to use your cool new social networking site, you don't really want to be pissing him off and not let him sign up, right? And that doesn't even get to the, to the areas of hyphenated names. Um, one of my friends in Portland hyphenated his name uh, with his wife's when he got married and likes to tweet every single time he tries to log in for something. And it's like, that's not a legal name. And he's like, yes, it is. Uh, there's non-standard characters. I'm sure that here in Europe, you probably encounter this a lot more. Us Americans aren't so good at handling and expecting these things to happen. And then I'm waiting for the day when someone gets their first emoji name. So that's going to happen sometime, too. And names aren't the only ones, right? We have the same sort of problems with email addresses. We, it's common that to have uh, the, the plus filter option for Gmail that be rejected from, from email columns. Um, but as the number of uh, fancy domain names and new registrars expand, uh, that's going to become a bigger problem for our software as well, not being able to accept those emails. And so this is a list of uh, examples of valid email addresses given by Wikipedia. So do you think anyone can write a regex for that? I can't. I'm not going to do that. So when, when dealing with input, we have to expect that people are going to have weird email addresses like this. <clears throat> what to expect when validating input is only one example. Uh, adding protections for the explicit expectation that edge cases will occur uh, is also very important in our code. And this includes using mutexes correctly, using database transactions, uh, and using background jobs, and being able to store the state of that and be able to transfer that information back in, in a reasonable way. This is all um, can be things that are very, very difficult to do correctly. So what I want you all to take away is that human experience has increased dr dramatically in the last 400 years. We've gone from our baseline of living in the world of thousands and thousands to expanding into the millions and millions, billions and billions, and the trillions and trillions. And we, as software developers, live in this trillions and trillions world a lot more than we might expect. To write scalable code, we must develop for the millionth user that uses our software, for the billionth request that hits our servers, and for the trillionth event that happens within our code base. And in this sort of scenario, we have to assume that the edge case, in this case, is the certainty, and not expect that, that the experiences that we live as humans is going to be representative of every single human that uses our software. And that's how we're going to be able to create better, stronger, faster, safer software for everyone to use. Thank you.